Is it worth purchasing an NVIDIA RTX 2080 for a 4th gen Intel i7 CPU? That is the question we're going to explore in this video. We'll also do a quick unboxing of the RTX 2080 from NVIDIA. I'll give you the quick answer right off the bat. I feel a 4th gen i7 running at 4 gigahertz playing at QHD resolution is the minimum requirements for this card. By the end of the video, you should have an understanding of how I came to this conclusion and what it means for your gameplay. I do not cover 4K here. I'm only playing in QHD, and this setup is for a three-year-old gaming rig. This is NVIDIA's new line of video cards that support ray tracing, hence the RTX instead of the GTX. Ray tracing will be all the hype for some time, but it was still a new technology that is only available in a couple of games right now. Between price fluctuations in the market and the introduction of new cards, if you could wait it out a bit, I would. I made this investment for a different reason. My gaming rig was having a hard time keeping up, constantly turning down settings while demanding more from my overall setup. Point is, I had to do it now and would have rather waited longer. Here's my current rig. The CPU is an Intel i7 4th gen running at 4 gigahertz. <clears throat> I'm not overclocked even though the motherboard supports it. I have 16 gig of RAM. My current video card is a GTX 970 under the MSI brand. At the base, it's an 850 watt power supply. So we're gonna swap out the GTX 970, the MSI Dragon, and we're gonna put on a few pounds here. In goes the RTX 2080. The big question a lot of people ask when they invest in this card is, is my power supply enough to handle this thing? And you should examine that. As you see, I have an 850 watt power supply and that should be enough. But it wasn't for me. And that's because I have an untraditional setup. I use my computer like a central server that hosts five main stations. A workstation where I do my gaming and video editing that consists of a 27 inch QHD Asus monitor and a 24 inch HD monitor in the secondary. The second station is a 55 inch HD LED for entertainment, cushion movies, couch surfing, etc. like that. The third station is the Oculus VR, which runs two 1080p screens within its headset. Plus I run the 55 inch external with that as well. The fourth station is a gaming cockpit that uses either both the 55 inch and or the Oculus Rift VR. The fifth station is a stand-up setup for audio recording and utilizes the two main screens. It all translates to a lot of hard drives, a couple dozen USB ports providing full power and throughput, five displays, and over a dozen controllers, keyboards, and mice. Let's look at two benchmark tests, Assassin's Creed Odyssey and Shadow of the Tomb Raider. Both games are released around the same time frame as this card. They are both pretty demanding. Let's start with Assassin's. <laughs> all the displays are off through the driver and the Oculus is disconnected. This would mimic a single screen gaming setup. I was running good playing the latest Assassin's Creed at, at the highest settings. Then I noticed the audio popping at times and a general feeling that the CPU wasn't getting what it needed. I saw the CPU tax at over 90% when gaming. I also saw it running hotter than normal. I adjusted my fan speeds in the machine and that was enough to put me over the limit with power. I would game, get everything nice and hot and the fans would speed up and then everything would start crashing due to lack of power being available. So I went out and upgraded the power source to 1200 watts. I am so thankful I have a modular power supply as swapping it out was, all, was a breeze. I put all my equipment back in, even threw in some extra U powered USB cards and she's singing along now. Overall I'm happy, but the CPU is bottlenecking. I expected this. It's not bottlenecking so bad that it's killing game performance, but it's definitely putting a ceiling on it. As we see, Assassin's is struggling to meet 60 frames a second, and overall is hovering around the low 50 frame per second rate. While the, while the benchmark didn't perform great, the game is very playable. I would have liked to see an average of 60 frames per second, but in game I have no issue. Next we have Shadow of the Tomb Raider. I thought for sure this game would put more demand on the system, but it actually performs very well. We are maintaining average frame rates well above 60 frames per second. Hey! Cuidado, niños!
The GTX 970 was the bare minimum for an Oculus Rift setup. And now that I'm using the RTX 2080 with VR, it's so much smoother. VR can be a bit nauseating. Running at a lower frame rate can only make that situation worse. I definitely feel more stable and less queasy now with a proper video card. Take that in mind if you decide to implement the VR setup. Some of the renderings here are similar. Assassin's is definitely more detailed on the flyovers, but I have to give Tomb Raider engine some credit here in, in how quickly it's drawing this. I also feel like the car is not working as hard as it was through Assassin's, and that could be the developer taking advantage of some of the new technologies available. Whatever it is, I'm happy. So in conclusion, I'm happy I made this investment. I'll have fun with this card and it stabilizes the whole system. I do wish it was cheaper, but that's a matter of current timing. I'm happy that only changing this one card made all the difference. Yes, I had to up my power supply, but that is a little unique to me and also somewhat a pre-existing condition. If you have an aged CPU, compare it to the baseline specs here. Intel i7 4th gen at 4 GHz will support the 2080 with limitations. Hope you found this video helpful. Please like and subscribe. Thanks for watching.